A lot of people say, I go way back with so-and-so, right? Well, some people certainly have heard of the recent work of our keynoter tonight, Peter Gray, uh, who is an expert on Sudbury, on play, uh, on you know all kinds of uh, learner-centered approaches, and homeschooling, and so on. And I say I go way back with him because I first met him and his son at a conference in 1986. I thought, but I was wrong. That's not when I met him. Turns out that when I was at Goddard College and I was working on designing my first school 20 years before that, I hired a couple of people to teach at that school and one of them was Mary Jane Carlson, his mother. <laughs> Peter Gray. <laughs> the way my mother tells the story, she hired Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Jerry and I, uh, it is interesting. You know, I didn't really, I don't know if I ever met Jerry back then. I was the square member of my family. My mother was a hippie. My, all my younger brothers were hippies. And I was uh, off at college and then graduate school in uh, New York. And they were doing crazy things in Vermont. My mother was starting a commune. And I do remember going back there. And, I, and there were these hippie kids that were about my age. And Jerry was probably one of them. And <laughs> so, uh, so here is Jerry still here. Amazing. You know, this is half a century ago. You know, back then we were the same age. He's a lot older than I am now, but back then. <laughs> but that then we were both, you know, 22 year old kids. <laughs> so I would, I would really like to hold a round of applause for Jerry. Jerry has been. <laughs> Jer Jerry has been maybe the most consistent voice for freeing children, for children's rights for 50 years now. You know, beginning with that little school in Vermont, maybe it even began before that, I don't know. And continuing on through founding and leading many, many other schools, through starting Arrow, which is now in its 27th year. I'm not sure, you know, this idea of free schools was very much alive in the 1960s. I'm not sure if it wouldn't have died out were it not for Jerry, who's really kept the flame alive. And now what we need to do is we need to blow on that flame. We need to get that flame into a roaring fire. We need to really create a movement, a movement that will be a sustaining movement towards self-directed education. and. Um, Towards that end, um, tomorrow at 3.30, one of the workshops is going to be a workshop that I and some other, some of my friends and colleagues will be in, uh, involved in that has to do with starting a, a new organization called the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. I think of this organization as both a complement and a complement to Arrow. It's a complement in that it's inspired by Arrow. It's in the footsteps of Arrow. It is, it, it, we look up to Arrow, and, um, and, uh, and it's really Arrow, I think, that has made us possible. It's a complement in that we're not going to try to do what Arrow already does so well. We're going to try to do some other things that have to do with pushing uh, for a national and international movement for self-directed education. I may say a little bit more at the end of the talk about it, but uh, I do hope that this, at least some of you who are interested in self-directed education as a movement would be interested in coming to this. It will give you some information about what our plans for this organization, but even more important, we'll be looking for your ideas about what uh, a new organization can do to help um, move uh, self-directed education along. So I'm a, an evolutionary psychologist, uh, which means that I'm interested in human nature, 
I'm interested in how that nature came about by natural selection. I'm especially interested in the nature of children, of human children, and I'm most especially interested in those aspects of children's nature that came about by natural selection to serve the function of education. And that's really all aspects of children, all those things that we think of as, ch as, as the characteristics of children, their curiosity, their playfulness, their sociability, their willfulness. I'm going to argue that all of these things came about in the course of evolution to serve the function of education. Unfortunately, in our standard schools, we shut all of these off. And, there, and then we try to teach them rather than allow them to educate themselves in their own natural ways. So um, you have a handout here. Uh, does everybody have it? If there's anybody who doesn't, maybe there's some extra copies that could be brought, or maybe you could share. There's a couple of extra copies. But the um, front page, the front page of this uh, is an outline of the talk, and the back page is there so that you'll know that I'm a college professor. <laughs> the, uh, you, you have until Sunday morning to read these chapters and articles, and then at the closing ceremony there will be a test. So. So I'm on B here on this handout. What is self direct So the, the title of the talk is, What is Self-Directed Education? How does it work? How do we know it works? So first of all, what is self-directed education? Let me start with, uh, what is education? You know, m for the most part, when we use the term education in our culture, and most people think of education as schooling, um, it's something you get, you go and you somebody gives you an education, uh, you maybe pay for an education. Um, it's something that we think of as actively given by the teacher to the student. The, the, the words we use, the grammar we use, puts the teacher in the active tense and the student in the passive tense. The teacher teaches or educates and the student is taught or is educated. So that's the view that we have of education, and of course that view is entirely wrong in terms of how education has always occurred throughout human history before the advent of, um, of modern schools. It always was the reverse. Education was something always actively pursued and acquired by the child. Uh, and had little to do with whether or not adults were interested in helping the child out. I mean, if, adult, if throughout history children have to, had to depend upon adults teaching them, we would not have survived as a species. We survived <laughs> as a species because children come into the world burning to learn about that world, and we can't stop them from learning about it unless we lock them away in closets or we shut them away in schools and cut off their, <laughs> their natural ways of learning. So when I, when I talk to uh, groups of social scientists or anthropologists in particular, I have a certain definition of education which goes like this. Um, the um, education is cultural transmission, put in simple terms. Education is the transmission of skills, knowledge, values, lore from one generation to the next. It's the entire set of processes by which that, by which culture moves from one generation to the next. We have always been the educative animal. That's the thing that distinguishes us from the other animals. We absolutely depend upon education. We depend upon cultural transmission. Every generation starts off with the knowledge and skills, or at least some of the knowledge and skills of the previous generation, and then builds upon that. And that's what education is. Throughout human history, it was the onus for education, as I just said, was always on the child. It was not on the adults. Children come into the world designed to educate themselves. <clears throat> for, um, 
purposes of uh, when I'm talking to other groups, I will sometimes define education differently from that, but in a way that I don't think is incompatible with that definition, but which has to do more with the concerns, instead of the concerns of people who are interested in human history and human biology, the concerns of people who are interested in children developing in our world today. And that definition of education goes like this. Education is the sum of everything a person learns that enables that person to live a satisfying and meaningful life. Whatever meaningful means to that person, meaningful to the person. Whatever it is that a child learns to live a satisfying and meaningful life. This includes the kinds of things that people all over the world and throughout history have had to learn to live a satisfying and meaningful life, or at least that are a big advantage for learning, for living a satisfying and meaningful life. Things like walking on two legs, things like speaking your native language, things like being able to get along with other people, being able to see from other people's points of view, which is essential to a satisfying and meaningful life. Things like being able to control your own emotions things uh, like being able to um, uh, think critically, being able to innovate, being able to solve problems. These are general skills that, if you think about them, really can't be taught in school. These are things, though, that are essential to learn and that children pretty much always learn on their own, in their own natural ways. Then there are other things that are sort of more cultural specific varies from culture. So if you're growing up in a hunter-gatherer culture, you've got to learn how to, and you're a male, you've got to learn how to track animals and shoot, and you've got to learn how to, whether you're male or female, how to do the dances of your culture and so on and so forth. In our culture, there are things that aren't absolutely essential to learn, but they're certainly valuable to learn if you want to have a satisfying and meaningful life. Learning how to read learning how to use numbers, uh, because we are a literate and numerate culture. Learning how to uh, use computers in this day and age. I mean, my God, you know, that's clearly the most important tool of our culture today, and yet some people are surprised to see how much time young people, children, spend on computers. I'm often asked, you know, uh, shouldn't I be banning my child from using computers? And my answer to that is it's like banning a hunter-gatherer child from using a bow and arrow. The computer is clearly the most important tool of our culture, and it's so, therefore no surprise whatsoever that children gravitate to the computer, that they spend lots of time, like it becomes a second, second nature to them because it's so obviously an important tool. So children come into the world designed not only to learn those species general things that we have to learn no matter what, we're culture, what culture we grew up in, but they come into the world designed to look around and see what are the important things in my culture that I've got to learn. And they tend to gravitate towards those things and focus on those things. Most of education um, for everyone, whether they go to school or not, occurs outside of school. I think everybody has to agree with that. If you think about it, the great bulk of what you know that's been useful to, in your life is not what you learned in school, it's what you have learned in the course of life outside of school, before school, after you're done with school, and the hours uh, that you're not in school even when you are a child. So to think of education as schooling is an extraordinarily limited way of thinking of education, even if we're talking about people who go to school. So some of the, uh, I said that uh, children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves. Um, let me, um, say something about what I mean in, in ter by that biological design. What is that design? They come into the world curious. All normal children are curious. You know, uh, Aristotle, in his great treatise on the origin of knowledge, his first sentence was, man is a curious animal. And he didn't mean that we're a strange animal. He meant that we are... <laughs> that we are an animal prone to explore the world around us, and that's the origin of knowledge. And that's the origin of knowledge in every human child. Every child comes into the world designed to construct his or her own knowledge through curiosity. Almost, in fact, there are experiments with newborn babies. They've just 
come out of the womb, they're already exploring their world. They're already more likely to look in the direction of something novel. They can barely see, but yet they, to the degree that they can see one thing versus another, they look at one thing and then now they're not interested in that anymore. They want to look at this other thing. They are exploring the novel. By the time they're able to move around, by the time they're able to manipulate things, they're manipulating anything within their reach. They're figuring out what you can do with this thing. What happens if I squeeze it or poke it or drop it? Um, they are constantly, constantly exploring. And this curiosity, this drive to explore, doesn't end at age five or age six unless we shut it off by sending them to a school where their curiosity no longer counts, where their questions no longer matter. And then they learn, my, they learn to suppress their curiosity when that, when that occurs. But other than that, people are curious throughout their lives. I've seen people on their deathbed who wanted to stay alive for another day just to see what would happen <laughs> next, you know? That's what we want to know. I mean, the worst, the worst, um, you know, one of the worst tortures for anybody is to put them in solitary confinement where there's nothing new to see. That's torture. Isn't that interesting that that would be torture? Every other need is satisfied. You've got food, you've got water, you're, there's no pain. And yet that's torture, to be there in a setting where there's nothing new for you to explore. So we are a curious animal. We are also a playful animal. Children come into the world biologically designed to play and to play in precisely those kinds of ways that will lead them to acquire those kinds of skills that I said you have to acquire no matter what culture you're growing up in. And also designed to look around and play at the kinds of skills that are important to their own culture. So they play, we're the animal that builds things. So we're, we're the animal with opposable thumbs. They play at building things when they have the opportunity to learn how to use those opposable thumbs. We're the linguistic animal. They play at language. They play all kinds of games with language. Little babies learn language and play cooing and babbling are all learned and playful. First words are never used to ask for anything. They're always just playfully used to point things out. And they're always said when the child is in a good and playful mood. Social play in which children are playing with other people and they're learning other kids and they're learning how to get along with other kids. Risky play in which children are climbing trees too high and swinging too high in the swing and walking up the slide instead of sliding down it and they're learning courage. They're learning how to, how to experience fear and control that fear. Children are biologically designed in play to practice those very skills that are so important for them to be able to develop, to live a satisfying and meaningful life. Some of the evidence that leads me to these conclusions comes from my looking into uh, childhood in hunter-gatherer cultures. Now, I've never had the privilege or opportunity to live in a hunter-gatherer culture and observe them directly. But I have looked into their lives in two ways. One is by reading whatever I could find uh, written by anthropologists who have lived in such cultures. And since there's not actually a whole lot written about children and children's lives in such cultures, I supplemented that by surveying um, uh, anthropologists, 10 anthropologists, who are fairly well-known anthropologists, who among them had lived in seven different hunter-gatherer cultures on three different continents. Um, as you may know, all of us, all human beings, were hunter-gatherers until a mere 10,000 years ago. From a biological perspective, from the perspective of evolution, 10,000 years is almost nothing. So basically, we evolved in the context of a hunter-gatherer culture. So it turns out that some people have managed to survive in a fairly pristine hunter-gatherer culture kind of way into the middle and even late uh, 20th century. I would say that there's no pristine hunter-gatherer culture today. There are some that are still hanging on in some ways. But as, as recently as the 1970s and 1980s, it was still possible for anthropologists to trek out into remote parts of the world where that hadn't been invaded by, by uh, so-called Western civilization 
and find people who were still living in this natural hunter-gatherer way of life. Now, what's interesting is wherever they found them, whether they found them in Africa or Asia or South America, whether they found them in deserts or in, in uh, rainforests, there was a certain, there was remarkable similarity among them from one to another in certain ways. They all had different languages, they had different art forms and so on and so on, different religions, different cultures and all of that sense. But there was a remarkable similarity, enough so that anthropologists sometimes use the word hunter-gatherer culture in the singular. So what's similar about them is these are all band cultures. They're not tribal cultures. Sometimes people talk about hunter-gatherer tribes. It's a misnomer. These are band cultures. There's no such thing as a chief. These are people who are, they are another term for these hunter-gatherer band cultures is egalitarian cultures. That's actually used in the literature because there's no other cultures that have been found that are as egalitarian in the sense they don't have leaders, they don't have big men, they don't have chiefs, they don't have any kind of hierarchy, they don't have differences in wealth, they share everything within the band. They move around from place to place, which means that there's no point in owning anything more than you can carry on your back. So that's one thing that helps make things egalitarian. If you're rich, you're just, if you had a lot of material goods, you would just be burdened down by it. So the primary ethos of this, these cultures is that everybody's equal. And they work towards that. It's not like it just comes naturally. It's not like it's human nature that everybody's equal. It's, there is a certain part. We inherited from the, you know, we're, most primates are very hierarchical. <laughs> the, you know, there are alpha males who dominate the, so the subordinate males, and most of the males dominate the females. So here's these, this group of primates, human beings, who are not living that way. They're living in a kind of state of equality. And they create that state of equality quite actively. They do things to reduce the likelihood of domination. One of the things they do is they use humor. Anybody who acts like they're a big shot, everybody just teases them and puts them down and ridicules them. <laughs> you know, the uh, you know, there's one story an anthropologist said. Uh, you know that, you know, so so this young guy who went out and he brought, came back with a fat antelope and you know when you come back with a fat antelope you're supposed to talk about how skinny it is and it was so sickly and the only reason you got it is because it hardly could walk and even then it was not anything to do with your skill at bow and arrow it was the wonderful arrow that somebody else made and gave to you if you fail to do all of that the rest of the tribe will do it for you. They will, <laughs> uh, and this will be led <laughs> by, the, by the grandmothers. <laughs> and the, uh, the wise elder who was explaining this to the anthropologist said, why do, he, the anthropologist says, well, why, why do you do that? And he said, because we know that young men who think too highly of themselves can be dangerous. <laughs> and so we don't allow them to grow to think too highly of themselves. So this is the hunter-gatherer culture that we evolved in. Now, they have, as part of their egalitarian ethos, they have an extraordinary sense of individual autonomy. For me to tell you what to do, even if it's good advice, even if I just am try think I'm helping you, I'm, I see you're doing this and I know a better way to do it and let me tell it to you, that would be kind of taboo in that culture because I'd be acting like I'm better than you, like I know something that you don't know. There might be some way I could help you out, but I'd have to be very careful to do it in some way that I am not acting like I'm better than you just because. Now what's amazing, so they don't tell one another to do and this is what at first I couldn't believe. It was only when I heard it from so many different anthropologists. They don't tell children what to do. They really don't tell children what to do. I heard this over and over and over again. Can you imagine that? Raising children, and they also don't raise children. Raising, by the way, is post-agricultural. We raise vegetables, we raise children, <laughs> so on and so forth. They didn't have agriculture, so they didn't raise children. Children kind of grew like, <laughs> like trees grow. <laughs> They had that different attitude about how children, the, the adults are kind of like the soil that the children are using for their own purposes as, as they are growing. 
So my survey of these anthropologists and the reading I did led me to three conclusions about how education occurs in hunter-gatherer cultures. The first conclusion is that adults do not direct children's activities. They trust children's instincts and they trust children's judgments, believe it or not. Let me just read a couple of quotations that illustrates this. So this one comes from a researcher named Yumi Goso, who studies uh, groups of, uh, studied groups of uh, hunter-gatherers in South America, but she's writing here about hunter-gatherers in general. Hunter-gatherers do not give orders to their children. For example, no adult announces bedtime. At night, children remain around adults until they feel tired and fall asleep. Adults do not interfere with their children's lives. They never beat, scold, or behave aggressively with them, physically or verbally, nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. Nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. So this is what I heard over and over and over again. There was one anthropologist who I interviewed who studied um, uh, he and his wife studied a group called the Batak in, um, in Indonesia. And he said that they have a number of taboos in their culture. One is there no murder. Another is you don't have sex with your daughter or your sister or other close relatives. And another is you never hit a child. So that's a taboo. That would be, it's right up there with murder and incest. I'm not necessarily saying it's quite as high as murder or incest. Murder and incest occur occasionally, and so probably does occasionally hitting a child, but it's never approved of. If somebody is hitting a child in a hunter-gatherer culture, immediately they assume that that parent, there must be something wrong with that parent, and we need to, we need to intervene, we need to calm the parent down, we need to take the child and comfort the child because hitting a child is not an appropriate behavior in this culture. So here's another uh, quotation. The idea that this child is my child or your child does not exist. In other words, you don't own your child. Deciding what another person should do, no matter what his age, is outside the aquana vocabulary of behaviors. There is great interest in what everyone does, but no impulse to influence, let alone coerce anyone. The child's will is his motive force. This is uh, somebody that many of you may have heard of, Jean Laidloff, who's not an anthropologist, but who was a young explorer who uh, uh, was exploring in South America and uh, happened to become acquainted with these, this group of South American, um, Native Americans, Native South Americans, and wrote a wonderful book called The Continuum Concept about it, which uh, many people today actually, uh, or at least some people today, take almost as their Bible of child raising. So, um, so others have written about how young children, I don't have the quotes, about how young children are allowed to explore their environment. One of my colleagues at Boston College, is named, uh, who's Gilda Morelli, lived for um, many, many months with a group of hunter-gatherers called the Efe in Central Africa. And she's showed me slides that she's taken of toddlers playing with fire, playing with machetes, parents, adults sitting in the background, not paying any attention to this. And um, I asked her, well, why, why are they letting them play? Don't the kids sometimes get hurt? These little, little kids with big, sharp knives, and they're playing with fire. Don't they sometimes burn themselves or cut themselves? And what she said was, yes, <laughs> sometimes they do. But these are typically very minor injuries. And if you were to ask the adults, uh, why is it you take them these things, why don't you take these things away from them? They say their first answer would probably be, well, because, you know, why should we take them? This is what they want to do. <laughs> you know, we don't control what they do. Um, and the second thing they would say is this is how they learn. That, that how are they going to learn how to use a knife? How are they going to learn how to use fire if they don't play with that? And the younger they start doing it, they may not say it in these terms, but this is me talking now, the younger they start doing this, the more this is going to be an actual extension of their body. That knife is going to be an extension. They're going, it's going to be like second nature. 
to be able to use that knife, just like our two-year-olds playing with computers. It's becoming an extension of their body. They, that, they will have a natural way of using computers that Jerry and I will never have. <laughs> so, that's, um, so, that's part, so that's, that comes from the studies of hunter-gatherers. Uh, by the time that children are four years old, they are able to go off with the other kids uh, away from adults. Uh, under four, of course, I'm sure it varies a little bit from child to child, but typically under age four, they're still kind of regarded as infants. They need to be around camp, they need to be in sight of adults because as the hunter-gatherers would put it, they haven't yet developed judgment. By the age of four, they typically have judgment. And it's interesting that a lot of psychologists have said something really important happens around age four, that that's when children have internalized language to the degree that they can kind of keep in mind rules and they can talk to themselves about what's safe and not safe, and that they're able to control themselves through verbal reminders to themselves, which, they ha the, which the typical three-year-old is not yet quite that capable of doing, and the two-year-old very rarely is capable of, of doing that. So something happens around four, and it's very interesting, therefore, that around four is where children are now called children, and they're running with the other kids, and nobody feels like adults have to follow them around. Interestingly, childhood ends not really until you have children yourself. To, so we sometimes think that, um, that adolescence is sort of a new invention, that teenage, by the time you were 13 or 14 and these other cultures, you would be an adult. Not true. The kids are still kids uh, until, according to some of the anthropologists, they're late teens and maybe even beyond that. Uh, typically, it's when they begin to have their own children, and even then, they may to some degree be running with other kids as they gradually go into adulthood. So the second, um, the, oh, let me also say, there's one other quote I wanna read on this issue of uh, being so indulgent towards children. Some people think that if you're this indulgent, you allow children to do whatever they wanna do, the children are going to become spoiled. Well, here's what Elizabeth Marshall Thomas says in response to that question. This is from a book called The Old Way, which I would recommend. Elizabeth Marshall Thomas was one of the, of, of a, a member of a family, an explorer family, who was among the first to make contact with a group in Central uh, Africa called the Juwansi, that uh, also are called the Kong, and have been probably the most, since that time, the most studied of all hunter-gatherer groups, but they, she made contact with them, she and her family made contact with them at a time when they had had essentially no previous contact with the West. And she wrote this book called The Old Way about uh, some of um, what she learned in, in that experience. But here's what she says about the question of spoiling. We are sometimes told that children who are treated so kindly become spoiled. But this is because those who hold that opinion have no idea how successful such measures can be. Free from frustration or anxiety, sunny and cooperative, the Juan children were every parent's dream. No culture can ever have raised better, more intelligent, more likable, more confident children. When I first read that, it was before I had talked to many other um, people, anthropologists who had, t who had observed children, I thought that she's probably exaggerating. She probably just fell in love with these kids and she's exaggerating. But I heard similar stories from so many others um, <laughs> that I began to think there's gotta be something to it. These kids are really well adjusted. Um, I once was, um, I once gave a talk at an evolutionary psychology conference, and after the talk, I'd mentioned something about hunter-gatherers, and so on. after the talk, a graduate student uh, came up and said to me that she was doing her dissertation on whining. She had this uh, view about that there's a universal tone to whining, and she wanted to know what hunter-gatherer whining sounds like, <laughs> and so, <laughs> I said, I don't know. I've never lived in a hunter-gatherer culture, but let me ask my friend, Gilda Morelli. So I, I went and asked Gilda Morelli, who had lived with the FA, 
And she had to stop and think. And she said, you know, I lived with, I lived with these people and interacted with the children for months and months, and I don't think I ever heard a child whine. <laughs> They didn't have anything to whine about. <laughs> now, admittedly, they don't have all the kinds of things that we have in our culture. And so I'm not saying that it's even possible to raise children in our culture today in such a way that they will never whine. But wouldn't that, isn't it interesting that here is at least two different people talking about two different cultures and saying how t talking about how well adjusted the children are and how bright they are and how sociable they are. Okay, so the second, the second uh, major lesson that came from my looking at, into hunter-gatherer cultures is that children, including teenagers, have unlimited time um, to play and explore, unlimited time. When I asked them, I, one of the questions I asked the 10 anthropologists was, how much, t how much time did the children in the culture that you observed have for play? And they said, every one of them said, essentially all the time. Some of them said, well, maybe sometimes somebody would ask them to fetch some water or to bring, or to do something like that. But it was always minor, and it was never an order. It was always just if you're willing to do it, you know. So sometimes, and sometimes they would engage in some hunting and some gathering, but it was always playfully done. It was part of their play. It was never uh, something that was expected of them. It was never how the culture put food on the table was to send children out to do these kinds of things. So this is a culture in which children are exploring and playing on their own all day long from dawn to dusk, from the age of four, when they are regarded as having common sense and don't have to be watched, until their mid to late teens, interestingly, kind of our school age years. Um, and, um, and the adults believe that in the process of this, they are learning what they need to learn to become good hunters and gatherers and good citizens of the culture, people who have the kinds of skills that contribute to the culture as they merge into adulthood. The third character, the third thing that I learned is in their exploration and play, the children do indeed play at the things that are important to their culture. Not everything that they do, they play all kinds of fantasy games and you could argue that there's nothing unique about that game that would would prepare them uniquely for their culture but clearly I asked I asked the um, my respondents to list some of the things they saw children playing at and it was very clear that much of what they listed matched very well onto the skills that the children had to learn in that culture to be successful so the boys in all of these cultures played endlessly at tracking, uh, tracking and hunting. Tracking is an extraordinarily difficult skill. And of course, hunting, shooting bows and arrows or blow, blow darts or whatever the, the, the means of, of uh, killing game is also is an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary skill that takes a lot of time to develop. And children are constantly, not because anybody is assigning them to do that, not that anybody's testing them on that, not that anybody's judging who's farther along and bow and arrow uh, ability. Who's the, who's the better tracker? Nobody's paying any attention to that, but the kids are growing up in a culture where they can see this is a valued activity, and so they play at that activity. In the one culture that was included uh, in the Philippines, there's a culture called the Agta, where women also hunt, and not surprisingly, in that culture, the girls also play at hunting and tracking, just like the boys did, and right along with the boys. So those kinds of things that were sex-specific, the boys played at the male-type things, the girls played at the female type things. The, the majority of things are not sex specific. A lot of the, you know, building huts, building dugout canoes, playing musical instruments, all of those kinds of things, both boys and girls would play at. So um, what happened to that way of life? What happened to that? What uh, caused us to step out of the Garden of Eden? The, um, the answer is agriculture. Uh, Hunter-gatherers, being human beings, are clever people, inventive people. They, somebody decide, discovered that, well, if you just, uh, you, can, you can get a little bit more of these roots if you sort of cultivate this area. 
And um, gradually this merged into what today we would call farming. It didn't, I'm sure, occur all at once, and it occurred at different times in different parts of the world, but it apparently began about 10,000 years ago in the Mesopotamian area. And once it got to a certain level, it changed everything. S because once you have agriculture, then you have to have land ownership. If you're going to take all that trouble to plant and, and weed and cultivate, you're not going to just let somebody else walk in and take it away. <laughs> you can't do that. You've got to defend that land. You've got to say, this is my land. I own this land. Once you've got land ownership, then you've got differences in wealth. You've got some people who own land and other people who don't own land. And now the people who don't own land are dependent on the people who own land. So now you get hierarchy. Now you have some people who are dependent upon other people. And this leads inevitably to systems of masters and slaves, systems of lords and serfs, systems today that we call employers and employees. So you have suddenly now hierarchy. Now this old idea about raising children, not raising children, letting children grow up, <laughs> in a way in which their free will is valued, that doesn't work anymore. You, in a hierarchical society, free will could get you killed. <laughs> You've got to grow up where your primary purpose in life is to obey. Most people, by the time of feudalism, most people, of course, were slaves or serfs. There were a few lords and masters at the top. But most human beings, at least in the Western world, were, were slaves or serfs. And you had to obey. Your survival depended upon obeying. So the whole system of raising kids changed. The, the goal of child raising, and now it was child raising, was to, sub, to subdue free will. And the, the primary tool for subduing free will, of course, was the rod or the cane. And um, we know some of this history even from the Bible. I mean, have you ever looked at the Bible to try to get uh, child raising advice? Uh, <laughs> Let me, I've looked through the Bible to try to find child raising advice, and here's some of the things that I found. Um, in Proverbs, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Well, that's pretty mild compared to everything else I found. So here's Deuteronomy. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them, when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of the town. Then all the men of this town shall stone him to death. That's pretty severe. And I, I, I kind of hope that most fathers and mothers uh, pretended that their child didn't, uh, didn't uh, um, uh, disobey. <laughs> Um, and it isn't just the Old Testament. Here's, from, here's what uh, the Gospel according to Matthew has to say. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother shall be put to death. So the goal of child raising was obedience. If your child isn't obedient, that child doesn't even deserve to live. How far this changed from Hunter, from when it was a time to, uh, it was a crime to beat a child to it was a crime not to beat a child. That was the way the world changed after agriculture. This is the horrid history that followed, it's a short history from a biological point of view, that followed hunter-gatherer times and has preceded today. Maybe we are about to merge out of that history. The rise of industry didn't immediately solve the problem. In industry, again, you have people who own the businesses, and then you have people who are dependent on those who own the businesses. And just as rich farmers could get richer by having slaves and, and, and get working, at get, working people to death in the fields, People who owned businesses could get richer by having workers working as many hours as possible for as little pay as you could give them. And many of those workers were children, as we well know. 
So now things maybe even got worse. In the past, when kids were working in the fields, at least they had fresh air and sunshine, and they could get away, and they were not always in sight of their masters, and they could play in the context of it. But now they're in dirty factories, or they're in coal mines, and they're working in that way. And this, this is the world in which schools, as we know them today, came about. That's the point that I am leading up to. So the first, the first widespread system of compulsory schooling w occurred uh, in the in be really beginning. The first systems really began in the um, as early as the 16th century. They were part of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestants, unlike the Catholics believed that everybody needed to be able to read the Bible themselves. It wasn't enough to get it from the priest. You had to read the Word of God yourself. Well, corollary to that, of course, is that you've got to be able to read. So to save souls, they developed schools to teach children to read. And they required, in many communities, children were required, not by the parents, but by the, by the church, to go to such schools. Now, even more important than learning to read the Bible, of course, was believing the Bible, believing the Bible as gospel. So these were schools designed to teach reading and designed to indoctrinate the children in the gospel. Now, in addition to that, this whole idea of of obedience and suppression of will was also very, very dominant and very, very much part of the Protestant ethic as it had been previous to that time. And so the schools really developed for three primary purposes. One was to teach kids to read the Bible. Another was to teach obedience. Another was to indoctrinate children in, in biblical. And the schools that were developed we would recognize them as schools. They look just like the schools today, for the most part. They didn't have clocks, but they had hourglasses in the front to time the lesson. Everybody spent a certain amount of time on this lesson and another time. They had a curriculum. They even had teacher training to make sure that the teachers would teach the right lessons and not the wrong lessons. And of course, they had ways of testing. Now, there were some differences that the primary tool of education in those early schools uh, was, the, was the rod or the cane. And children were routinely beaten for, um, for getting wrong answers, not just for misbehavior in the, in the discipline sense, but even for getting wrong answers, they were routinely beaten. So the way that you... So, so that was different. I mean, today we don't beat children. We drug them or we uh, <laughs> shame them. Um, <laughs> we've given up that brutal method of, um, of uh, whipping children into shape. The paddling is still legal in some states and, uh, and it still occasionally occurs. We don't call it beating anymore, I guess. We call it paddling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these were the schools that came about um, beginning really as early as the 16th century. The first, um, the first schools, the first compulsory schools in the United, in, in what then was the colonies were in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has always been the leader in terms of compulsory schooling. And the, um, in, 19, in 1642 in Massachusetts, the Puritan clergy uh, required the children in the colonies to go to school. And they developed a reading primer called the New England Primer, which was colloquially called the Little Bible of New England. And I've seen uh, a copy of it or a, or a uh, facsimile of it. It's full of little ditties about how if you lie or you disobey your parents, you will spend eternity in hell. It's, uh, these are things that the children memorized, and these are the passages that they learned to read. There are little Bible passages in it. There, you learn your A, B, C's by first there's in Adam, and Adam is a big A. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. That's the first lesson in the ABCs, and so on. So that was the little Bible of New England, and it gives you some idea of what school was all about when it first started in, um, in the colonies. Coercive schooling was developed most fully and most completely in uh, Prussia, which was the largest of the German states. Prussia really took this idea and carried it much farther than anybody else. The, 
person who um, is really in many ways credited with the founding of the idea of universal compulsory education is a pietist priest uh, named August Hermann Franke, who in the late 17th and early 18th century uh, developed a system of pretty uh, effective uh, comp compulsion of families to send their children to school. And here, let me read a little bit about what he says school is all about. Above all, here's his, his, uh, his uh, from his uh, handbook for, for schoolmasters. Above all, it is necessary to break the natural willfulness of the child. While the schoolmaster who seeks to make the child more learned is to be commended, he has not done enough. He has forgotten his most important task, namely that of making the will obedient. So these people who founded schools, and these are the precursors of the schools we have today, were very clear about the purpose of school. They didn't hedge it. They didn't hide the terms. They were very clear. He goes on, Frankie goes on in this manual to say that the most effective way to, build, to break a child's will is through constant monitoring and supervision. He's, he, he was kind of against a lot of beating. He said that beating, you know, beating has an immediate effect, but it doesn't have the same long-term effect as constant monitoring and supervision. <laughs> so, so here's, what, um, here's what he said. Youth do not know how to regulate their lives. They are naturally inclined toward idle and sinful behavior when left to their own devices. For this reason, it is a rule in this institution that a pupil never be allowed out of the presence of a supervisor. The supervisor's presence will stifle the pupil's inclination to sinful behavior and slowly weaken his willfulness. John Wesley, the you know, founder of Wesley and Methodist uh, sect, was also uh, wrote a handbook for schools. And here's what he, this was some time later, and here's what he had to say. As we have no play days, so neither do we allow any time for play on any day, for he that plays as a child will play as a man. God forbid. So that's, <laughs> so that's, that's where our schools came from. And then in Prussia, and um, you know, then as churches began, the power of churches began to weaken and the power of states began to increase. States got the idea, let's take the schools away from the churches. Let's us, as states, run the school. Let the government run the school. And this occurred first, again, most effectively in Prussia. King William II declared in, uh, what was the year, 1794, that henceforth the schools would be run by the state, not by the church. The schools continued to be run in the same way, but now the doctrine that was being taught was a doctrine about nationalism and patriotism and how the German language is the best of all languages and how Germany is surrounded by enemies and so on and so forth. And we know what that led to eventually. So that was the, that was the origin. And every other nation looked at Prussia with envy. Wow. Look what they're doing. Napoleon loved it. This was how they could create little soldiers. In the United States, Horace Mann was very much impressed. Again, in Massachusetts, Horace Mann, who became the first secretary of education in any state, was so impressed by what was happening in Prussia and how it was going to create good citizens and how in this democracy in America we need the state to create good citizens that he imported this this pr procedure and also then created compulsory schooling. The, compulsory, the first compulsory state-run schools in the United States were in Massachusetts in um, 1864, if I remember right. And within about 50 or 60 years, every state in the United States had compulsory schooling. But it or originated from looking towards uh, Prussia seeing this idea that if we can control the development of children, we can control the citizenry. 
and we can ensure that we're not going to have rebellions, we're not going to have, you know, they were not so concerned. When you look at it, they were really not by this point so concerned about teaching reading anymore. Most people who could read, they realized that most people who were growing up in families that could read, could read, didn't have to, they were more worried that people were reading the wrong stuff. That, than that they, they were more worried about controlling thought than they were about, about, about teaching the skill of reading. So um, what does this all have to do with my theme here of self-directed education? The, um, ever since schools were started, there have always been reformers. There have always been people who say, you know, this isn't quite right. We need to reform the school. And what reform always, I shouldn't say always, but usually means is tinkering with the model. Let's take this model and, and make it more humane. <laughs> uh, let's be kinder to children. Let's be a little more child-centered. Let's um, you know, certainly not beat children. Um, let's try to take children's nature into account. So that's the approach taken, but the problem is the model itself came about for a particular purpose and was well designed for a particular purpose. It was well designed for indoctrination and obedience training. If you were to design a school from scratch, ignoring history, if you were to design a school from scratch and your goal was not indoctrination and obedience training, let's say your goal was the fostering of creativity, let's say your goal was to produce critical thinking, let's say your goal was to produce a diversity of interests because you believe that the culture requires different people with different ways of thinking and different skills, you would never design a school that looked anything like <laughs> what our schools are like. No way could you design a school that would do those things where everybody is supposed to be following a curriculum, <laughs> where there's a teacher in charge who's supposed to evaluate everybody. You can't possibly evaluate if you have a school that's designed for those other things. The whole point of evaluation is to make sure everybody's learning the right stuff. <laughs> and that means indoctrination. And it doesn't matter what you're indoctrinating. I mean, I've argued with some of my colleagues who say, what a crime it is that not everybody is being taught that n natural evolution by natural selection is a fact. And I say, well, you know, if you want to teach it that way, then all you're doing is indoctrinating. You're just doing the same thing as what you're complaining about that the other side is doing. So what you need to do is to trust people if you want this. And no way can you do that by tinkering with our current system. So that comes to self-directed education. Self-directed education cannot come out of a modification of what we have. It can't. It simply can't. Because what we have is a system in which there's a curriculum. And if there's a curriculum, if you have to learn certain things by certain times, and if the teacher's job is to make sure that kids learn that, no way are you doing anything that, that, that frees kids from the idea that their job is to obey the teacher. You might make it that they have to kind of guess, because you're not so clear what it is they have to do. You have, they have to kind of guess what they want you to do. But you still have a situation where their job is to figure out what they have to do for you to pass them, to get that passing grade. As long as they're being judged, their job is to figure out how they're being judged and to do what they're being judged on. And that is not the situation that's going to create critical thinking. That's not the situation that's going to create diversity in goals. That's not the situation that's going to foster curiosity. So what do you do? You have to start totally from scratch. You have to start with an entirely different model. You can't evolve this, you can't evolve self-directed education out of what we have, out of what was developed for the purpose of indoctrination and obedience training. So I first got interested in this issue um, when um, I got interested in the Sudbury Valley School. Now here's a school, I don't want to present this as the only model, but it's the one that I know. This, here's a school that was, that's been in existence now almost half a century. It started off, you know, back when Jerry and, and my mom were doing these hippie things. They started off with, uh, with a, they, this school, 
also st started off, um, <laughs> I was so jealous of these kids who were about my age who were hanging around my mom all the time. <laughs> <I can't laughs> okay, so anyway, they started. <laughs> So, they, so the school started off in 1968, back when there were a lot of little free schools. But this school has lasted. This school did something that most of the other schools didn't do. They really founded themselves with a constitution, a way to solve problems, a way to finance the school, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the things that ended up sort of destroying the other schools didn't happen at Sudbury Valley. But let me describe what Sudbury Valley did. They turned the hierarchy upside down. So instead of the idea that teachers, uh, that there are teachers, or that there are adults are in charge and that there's a curriculum and children have to learn the curriculum and the adults evaluate the students, they turned it around so that the school is quite literally owned by the students who are age four on through teenage years. And the staff are hired helpers. The staff have to be, uh, the, no staff members, including the people who founded the school, uh, have any kind of tenure, have any kind of job security. They have to go be hired, new contract every year, and part of the hiring process is a vote in which every student, as well as the staff members, vote. And uh, you have to get a majority vote in order to even have a hope of staying on with another contract there. So. If the kids don't like you, you're out in this school. This is a school that has no curriculum. It doesn't offer courses, although if people, students demand a course or ask for a course, staff members will respond um, uh, as, long as, as long as they think the request is sin sincere and not just motivated by their parents uh, telling them to ask for a course. Um, this is a school that has, in, remember how I said that uh, hunter-gatherers think that children have uh, common sense at age four? This is a school that you have to be four in order to go there. And uh, adults are not following you around. There's a big campus there. There's a, an adjacent forest. There's a pond. There's a street. And four-year-olds are not being followed around by adults. This school has now been in existence for, uh, as I said, almost 50 years. Uh, there's never been a serious injury, and yet four-year-olds, just like four-year-olds and hunter-gatherers, are walking around without adults watching them. But they're in an age-mixed group, and they tend to hang out with other kids, and uh, kids look out for one another, and so on. Kids are playing and exploring and sitting around, hanging out, doing what, what exactly what you would think kids would be doing when they're free to do what they want. And somehow, they are becoming educated. Um, right now, the school has 160 students from age four on through high school age. They're not segregated in any way by age. The key to how education works here is age mixing. Little kids are learning naturally through their interactions and observations of older kids. The, um, uh, the school uh, has many facilities for learning different kinds of things. Um, there's a kitchen, there's of course computers, there's lots of books, there's, but nobody's required to use any of this stuff. If somebody w just does computer all the time, plays Angry Birds, let's say, day after day after day after day, no staff member is going to come around and say, don't do that, <laughs> do something else, or don't you think it's time to do something else? They're not going to do that. They trust kids. That is a key part of it. That's one of the key parts of how it works. Somehow, this thing, this turns our notion of education upside down in a way that progressive schooling doesn't. Progressive schooling still has the idea that educators ultimately are involved here, that teachers have to be clever and figure out how to help students in a way that the student still feels like they have some control. But here's a situation where truly, children are in charge of their own education. And yet it works. My first study of the school many years ago was a study of the graduates. I was concerned. My own son had become a student there. And I was concerned, would he be able to go on <laughs> to be anything other than an artist? <laughs> and not that I would be unhappy if he became an artist, but I didn't want that to be the only possibility. 
And so I did a study of the graduates, and lo and behold, I discovered that there are a lot of fine artists who were students there. But in addition, there were people in the sciences, and there was a professor of mathematics who was a graduate of the school. I, I located almost all the graduates at that time. And those who wanted to go to college didn't have any difficulty getting into college, didn't have any difficulty adjusting college, even if they had never taken a course before, even if they had never read a textbook before. How did they do it? <laughs> You know, so I, you know, I asked them, and I found, I found that actually it turns out it's not that hard. You know, it's, um, there's not that much that anybody else has actually learned in high school. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know that. I teach in college, and, and, every, <laughs> and every, every professor who teaches the introductory course starts from scratch. You don't assume that the students remember something from high school. You start from scratch. And even if you thought they started, they learned something from high school, you would assume that they learned it wrong, that, they, that the teacher didn't understand it the right way, because you're the professor who knows the right way, and you're going to teach it from scratch anyway. So the, so the kid who's majoring in biology has never taken a biology course, turns out not to be at any disadvantage compared to the kid who's taken some biology in high school, similarly with other, other subjects. So this turned this turned my ideas upside down. Suddenly I began to think, well, you know, maybe my mom and Jerry weren't so crazy after all. <laughs> you know, maybe there was something to this idea. And uh, it's okay. I, I had been almost forced. I mean, my son more or less blackmailed me into sending him to Sudbury Valley at the age of 10. He'd been s misbehaving so deliberately and so terribly in the public school that he gave us no choice but to go there. And then I had to do a study to make sure that he it wasn't going to ruin his future by going there. So, uh, so it brought me. It turned it turned my views upside down, and um, and I began to get interested then in how children learn. Uh, so they apparently learn. Uh, how do they learn? How do they acquire these abilities? How do they do they they acquire what it takes? <clears throat> I then went on from there more recently, I got, because I started writing a blog for Psychology Today about self-directed education, and a lot of the people who were reading my blog were homeschoolers, and I didn't know much about homeschoolers, but particularly they were unschoolers, people who were, this was home-directed, self-directed education. I began to get invited to some of their conferences and to give talks and met some of the, the kids uh, who were at the conference. and I was impressed. They seemed a lot like Sudbury Valley kids. They seemed to have uh, a kind of uh, uh, grace about themselves. They seemed to be mature in a certain sense while still being childlike. They seemed to be able to look an adult in the eye. They seemed to, um, they seemed to be able to make friends easily despite the stereotype about homeschool kids that they're socially isolated and socially awkward. So I got interested in that. I wasn't, sh again, I wasn't so sure. Uh, you know, I did get this inkling from seeing the kids that maybe this works too. But I wasn't so sure it would work in that context. I always believed and still believe that kids need much more than their own parents. They need to learn from a larger community. They need to interact with a lot of other kids. And how are kids going to do that if they're growing up at home? So I did a survey first of homeschooling families. There were 232 families who responded. And I asked them a lot of questions about, I'm sorry, about unschooling families. And then I later on, these are both the, the articles in which these are published are among the articles listed on the back if you want to look up these articles. But then I did a study along with a colleague, Gina Riley, of grown unschoolers. We identified 75 uh, adults who had been unschooled for varying parts of their K, what would be their K through 12 years, including about a third of them who all of that, all of their previous education had been self-directed at home. And I found that they too were able to go to college if they wanted to, didn't have any particular difficulty getting in, didn't have any particular difficulty doing well. They too went into all sorts of careers, including science and math as well as art and human services and doctor and lawyer and so on and so forth. Didn't seem like taking that route was cutting anything short. So now what I want to do, if you look on this handout, um, we are at uh, G near the bottom, the optimal context for self-directed education. So I began to think, all right, I've looked at self-directed education in a hunter-gatherer cultures. I've looked at self-directed education at Sudbury Valley School. And um, I should say now that there are many other schools modeled after Sudbury Valley. And there's a whole set of new schools called Agile um, Learning Centers that you may have heard about. 
that <laughs> seems to have its own cheering <laughs> section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I had to mention them or they wouldn't talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and so this model is, is uh, apparently replicable too. And some of the Sudbury model schools have been around, around long enough that they've got graduates and they seem to be doing okay in the world. So, I will, so when combining all of this and looking now at the, at the unschoolers, what's common? What is it about? What is the context? I'm, I don't believe you can just turn kids out on the street and they're going to become educated. I think that we have to provide an environment in which they can become educated. In the hunter-gatherer culture, that band, that environment is automatically there. It's just there. You don't have to do anything to provide it. But in our culture, it's not necessarily just there at least not for every family, for every kid. You have to do something to provide it. So what is it that we need to provide? And that's this list of six things that I've come up with that in my mind, these are the optimal conditions for self-directed education. First is the social expectation and reality that education is the child's responsibility. If we pretend that it's our responsibility, or if we in some way assume that responsibility so the child comes to believe that it's our responsibility, then the child gives up that responsibility or to some degree. Every child is born instinctively believing it's their responsibility to educate themselves. But just like we can drive out other instincts, uh, we can drive out that belief. If we subject them to the view that the way you become educated is by doing what your teacher tells you to do then the responsibility is now on the teacher. It's no longer on the child. So that's the first thing. The second thing is unlimited freedom to play, explore, and pursue own interests. Unlimited freedom to do that. It takes a lot of time. It takes time to immerse yourself in something that interests you that's not interrupted by a bell, that's not, that can go on from one day to the next to the next and nobody's telling you now you've got to go on to something else. It takes time to be bored, time to say, okay, I, there's nothing interesting here. And as Danny Greenberg, who founded Sudbury, one of the founders of Sudbury Valley says, boredom stirs the soul. It's, don't try to relieve boredom in a child. Let them be bored until they can't stand being bored anymore and they decide to take control of, of that situation and figure out, find something to do. That, that is their own choice of what to do. You need time to go from one interest to another. You need time, maybe you're going to spend two years just playing Angry Birds, who knows? And then you're going to spend a couple years doing something else. You're going to play, you need time to, you need time to try out different things and you need to be unhurried about it. You don't need somebody looking over your shoulder saying, don't you think it's time to move on to the next thing? We need to allow, we need to trust our children to make those kinds of decisions and that seems to be true in hunter-gatherer cultures, that seems to be true at uh, Sudbury-type schools, and that seems to be true among successful unschooling families. The opportunity, the third character, the opportunity to play with the tools of the culture. I said those toddlers in hunter-gatherer cultures are playing with fire and they're playing with machetes and bows and arrows. By the way, I should say, so you don't think hunter-gatherers are really negligible, the poison darts are kept way up high in a tree <laughs> so the little kids can't get to them. These are not negligent parents. They make reasonable decisions. They realize that a poison dart could kill a child and a, you're not going to have a little child playing with poison darts. But a machete or fire, that's not going to kill a child. So you can play with those things. <coughs> But you need a Sudbury Valley, there's, there's cooking equipment, there's woodworking equipment, there's of course computers, there's the tools that we regard as the tools of our society. And once you've certified yourself, showing that you know how to use the stuff and know how to use it safely, then you can play, you can do your own things with it. Playing with it in this sense means try experimenting with it, doing your own thing, not just doing planned things that somebody else tells you what to do, but you're doing your own thing with it. The access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. In a typical classroom, there's one teacher. Maybe at best, there's two teachers. And they only exemplify the role of teacher. At Sudbury Valley, 
it's only seven adults and 160 kids, but yet that's seven adults, each one different, each one has different knowledge, different personality. Any one of them is available to any kid who wants to go there. The kids don't very often go to the adults. They're much more likely to go to other kids. But if they do want to go to an adult, they know which adult to go to. There's one adult that would be the right one to go to if you need a lap to sit on or a shoulder to cry on. There's another adult who might be the right one to go to if you're burning for a political argument. There's another adult for this or that. There's, and, in, and the kids are very good at figuring out which adult uh, to go to depending upon their needs. They're also good at figuring out which other kids to go to, depending on their needs. So that, that a variety of caring adults. In the hunter-gatherer band, the kids, all the adults are available. There's no, parents aren't, are not even all that special beyond the age of four. The kids are kind of kids of the whole band. They're not kids just of this parent, th that set of parents. Um, and and in, the, in, the, in the unschooling families at work, one of the things that, uh, that the, uh, that the respondents said repeatedly was that they had many adult friends. It wasn't just their parents. They had one of the things they valued about the unschooling experience was that they made many friends with other adults who they looked to, and they didn't just see their parents as role models. Four fifth characteristic free age mixing among children and adolescents. The, the founder of Sudbury Valley has argued over and over again that age mixing is the key to how it works. Throughout human history, in hunter-gatherer cultures, but even after hunter-gatherer cultures, children were never segregated by age, except not until the time of age-graded schools. Children always played in age-mixed groups. Our whole instinct to play evolved in an environment in which play was always age-mixed. Same age play is, a, is really an artifact of modern times, and it is not necessarily, it is not that it's bad to play same age play, but it is not as nurturing, it's not as helpful, it's not the same kind of learning opportunity. Age mixed play is, provides the younger child with the opportunity to be boosted up by the older child into a higher level of activity than he or she would otherwise engage in. And it provides the older child with the even more important opportunity to be the mature, leader, nurturing, teaching one in the context of the relationship and to get a sense of their own maturity and to learn how to be a parent and learn how to be a caring person. When we deprive children as we do in school and since so much of the rest of our society of interactions with others who differ from them in age, when we segregate pre-teens from post-teens, for example, we deprive them of interactions with those people from whom they have the most potentially to learn. So free age mixing, and one interesting thing that free age mixing is, is part of the essence of the way Sudbury Valley works. Interesting to me that in the unschooling study, the, even though I did, actually didn't ask, I'm surprised I didn't ask this question, many of them, over half of them volunteered the information that one of the great things about not being in school was they made friends not only with a lot of adults, but also with kids who were younger than them and kids who were older than them. So this seemed to, these first five characteristics seem to apply to even the unschoolers as well as applying to kids in hunter-gatherer bands and kids at Sudbury Valley. The sixth one, I used to say there are five, I've added a sixth one, which the more I think about it, the more I think is also important. Immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. Hunter-gatherer cultures, as I've described, are democratic communities in a different sense than in our culture. They make decisions by consensus, everybody's view is respected, and so on and so forth. And children don't necessarily have any kind of formal vote the way they do at Sudbury Valley, but their voice is heard, and even more important, the children are growing up in the context of a democratic environment and realizing that whether or not they are now, they will at some point be sitting around the fire engaged in serious discussions about that have to do with the band's welfare as a whole. They're seeing this, they're listening to it, they're in some sense, in some limited ways perhaps participating in it. And so they're growing up with a sense not just of responsibility for themselves, but also a sense of responsibility for the community within which they're developing. So children at Sudbury Valley, because they're involved in making the rules of the school, making big decisions about the school, and discussing who should be hired and who should be let go among the staff, and they're involved in the judicial system. If anybody breaks a rule, you go before the judicial committee, which consists of 
uh, of, a, of a cross section of ages of the school at any given time. And you're involved then in these discussions about, well, what should we do? So-and-so has consistently been breaking this rule. We like so-and-so. What are we going to do about it? What would be an appropriate penalty? What's, what, what's going to change this person's behavior? They're involved regularly in those kinds of discussions. So they're thinking about not just themselves. They're thinking about their community in which they're growing up. And that's an important thing to be thinking about if you're going to grow up in a democratic society, and we are going to be a democratic society. We need people who think not just about themselves, but think people who think about the community as a whole that they're growing up in. And I think that it's a little harder to say exactly how this works in the unschooling family, but to some degree the family itself is a stable, moral, democratic community if it works well. But even more so, I think, that the families in which unschooling seems to work well seem to be those families that are also very well connected with a larger community. And so the kids have a sense of being part of a larger community and a realization that they're growing up in a larger community and have responsibilities for that. So I think that our job, uh, w w you know, I said that education is children's job. Education, the onus of education lies with children. But we in our culture do have a responsibility. And our responsibility as adults is to provide the setting in which children can educate themselves. We've got to give up the idea that we educate children. Let's stop thinking that we educate children. Let's start thinking that we provide the setting in which they can educate themselves. And how do we do that? How do we do that as individuals? How do we do that as communities? How do we do that as a nation? How do we spread the word? that this is the way we ought to be thinking. This is what we need to do as a culture if we are going to have truly free and democratic people. We need to also, and I want to kind of end this way, you know, normally when we talk about education, whether it's self-directed or otherwise, we're talking about what are children learning, how do they learn, how do they acquire what they need to know. There's another thing that we ought to be keeping in mind. And that is this, that children are human beings. That childhood is actually a pretty good portion of any person's life. And if that portion of a person's life is not happy and is not free, then that's a crime. That's really a crime. We in democratic societies, um, <clears throat> we believe that there are certain uh, inalienable rights that belong to human beings the right to free speech, the right to free association, the right to due process if you're accused of a misdeed, the right to choose your own path to happiness. What could that mean? <laughs> Doesn't that have something to do with choosing how you educate yourself? These are described as human rights. We think of them as human rights. I would contend that children are human beings. And in our typical schools, we deprive children of every single one of those rights. We preach democracy to them. We might even say that it's a democratic school because we're preaching democracy and we're trying to respect children. But yet at that very same time, we are depriving them of all of what we call the basic human rights of a democracy. If we want to prepare children for democracy, don't we have to allow them to experience it growing up? And the school, the learning center, that's the place where they can experience it. And we need to think about education in that way. Well, these are the kinds of things that we'll also be talking about in, re in the workshop at 3.30 tomorrow <coughs> in talking about the mission of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. How can we spread the word? How can we get a movement started? How can we convince society as a whole uh, that we need to start treating children as human beings and that indeed we don't have to be afraid of doing that because there's a lot of evidence that if we provide the right context, we can treat children as human beings and they're going to grow up okay. So thank you very much for your really kind attention. <laughs>